This is Four Advisors by Advisors. I'm your host, Evan J. Mayer. And today we have a very special guest, somebody that I consider a dear friend, lives down the street from this office, <laughs> Mr. Jared Fisher. That's fantastic. Hey, Jared. Love it. Love it. Love the office. Love the setup. Love your podcast. You Th- a great job. Thanks, man. Jared is the Director of Financial Planning for Northwestern Mutual. Prior, he was a financial advisor, and he was a financial advisor with me. He worked with me for about 11 months, 10 months, something like that, almost a year. And he was a wholesaler most recently with advisor asset management in the structured products department. And I believe you were structured products prior to the current role too. Correct. So I had a couple different structured product roles within my career. And to be honest, it's something I still believe in. I think that those products add a ton of value. From a wholesaling perspective, one of the things I was doing a lot of education, explaining the underlying option strategies, telling them where this could fit in their overall portfolios. And that's how I got to where I am now. So tell us a little bit about your history in the business. How did you get started? Where have you been? What different roles have you done? So I I came out of college 2004 looking for a job and heard about these great new financial products on the street called mortgage-backed securities. So 2004, 2005, I was at BNY Mellon. And I was doing more of a middle office relationship management role. I started to succeed and had the opportunity to move on to the investment banking side over at Deutsche Bank. And by the time I was there, it was 2006. I was doing student loan securitizations, auto securitizations, residential mortgage backs. And um, you know, it got kind of sought first over there. Didn't put it, have enough money to get an ISDA and start uh, buying credit default swaps. But at the same time, we took a step back from there and went into uh, key accounts, which I absolutely love. Wife said she wanted to move to Florida. I love my wife. So we ended up in, in Florida and it was a great decision. I love it down here. Obviously family's up in New York along with friends, but, and you don't see a pace like you do in New York city. Yeah. And then, so when you started down here, you came to in capital, is that right? I was at in capital. I was wholesaling structured products, uh, specifically one issuer to mostly banks, but also in the independent space as well. And then you came to work with me at SunTrust. We were actually, yeah. you were in the same branches with me in same area with me. We were doing that for about 11 months. And then you got a good opportunity with an advisor asset management. Yeah, that's right. So uh, towards the end, I, I got a call from a buddy of mine who was starting up a distribution effort over at AAM and said, you know what, you get to pick the territories that you used to cover. So, which is great. Got to stay in Florida and was able to do it on a hybrid basis. So Jared, now you took on this role, director of financial planning at Northwestern Mutual, been in there since June, right? That's right. And what's the day-to-day like, what's the position and what's a day in the life like of the director of financial planning? No, it's definitely different coming from the wholesale background. So with this, I have, we have about 200 advisors in within the South Florida group. And in my role, part of it is to grow the investment business. And Northwestern Mutual has been one of the top players in on the life insurance space, but has more recently become more relevant on the investment side. So a lot of what I'm doing similar in from the wholesaling role is coaching. We bring on a ton, uh, quite a few new advisors and part of what I do is I have weekly calls. I also, I'm kind of I was described as the team CIO. So when there's actually you know, an investment opportunity, I'll help create the, uh, the allocations. Got it. So you'll go in and you'll kind of help the advisor more with the allocation. So it's more of a, more of a money management asset allocation, making sure advisors are taking advantage of the, the concept that the clients have investment needs on top of the insurance needs and making sure that everything is correlated together. Exactly. And one of the things that I think that you share this with me is planning and how important that is when working with clients, not only from a holistic perspective, but to identify different opportunities. Give us the inner workings on a structured note desk, okay? What are some things that advisors would be interested to know that they don't know already? So, you know, in the structured products world, it's a very different sale than that of say, mutual funds, ETFs, any other investment product, because you can go on Thomson of Reuters, you go on Bloomberg, and you could essentially run your own analytics. So with structured products, it's not something that's always been top of mind for advisors. So number one, it's very difficult at first to get in the door because you're selling something that's esoteric. They're used to the large fund guys coming in, buying the nice lunches, dinners, drinks, et cetera, et cetera. But now what we're seeing is advisors are trying to not be commoditized. So that being said, with the commoditization, you have used something like a structured note. 
something that they talk about with their friends, especially if it's something that's so slightly more exotic than that of your typical S&P note. And do you find, obviously, there's a lot more education training when you're going over products compared to mutual funds or annuities or other products that probably most advisors already know how those work at this point? Absolutely. And that's up to the whatever distribution firm we're talking about. They're going to develop certain marketing materials that are going to be in as plain English as possible so the advisor could wrap their head around it. At one point, I was really selling ETFs and It's a very, very different conversation. You slap a tear sheet down on an advisor's desk within about 10 to 15 seconds, they know what they're going to be doing. Yeah. Whether it's fit in their overall allocation. The thing with structured products is even in a fee-based account where you're still looking for something to fill a need. It's not your typical allocation. So Jared, give me a little bit about what's the role of an internal wholesaler? Obviously their main role is to contact financial advisors and get them selling as much product as possible. But what, you know, I've never lived in that role as far as what the day-to-day role entails and what you have to do and what are some of the positives of the job and what are some of the job parts of the job that you're like, this is just so not necessary. When you're an internal wholesaler, you're calling a financial advisor who's one main thing that they have is time. The most important thing in the world, can't give it back. It's all you have. So you need to come in with a very, very strong value proposition because you know what? They're getting calls from 15 to 20 a day. That's why the systems are so important to have a really good one. So as an internal, what your job is to do is really two things. One, get people on the phone, get the advisor talking for long enough that they understand what you're talking about. On the structured product space, you know what? Maybe they're either gonna hang up very quickly because they don't want nothing to do with you, or they're gonna listen because, oh wow, this guy's got something different to say. And do you have like your your fingers on, on the dial almost like to go to the next advisor or is there like a list in front of you, like a contact list? So generally there's some kind of a CRM system or you're gonna have your own prospect list in Excel. I always, when I was doing that job, I, had, I used CRM. But more importantly, I had the guys that I knew that were going to do custom notes. I knew guys that I needed to hit in certain areas and just people that I may have had conversations with in the past that could be potential buyers. So it's, it's important to have, you know, definitely using that CRM system as much as possible to keep everything in one place, but nothing's going to be as good as a good old. And that allows for what the external wholesaler to also see the notes in there so that if they're meeting with the advisor, they know the conversations that have taken place. Absolutely. And the most important thing is you're calling people, you know, mandated to make 75 calls a day. So that being said, do most firms track that? Are they like, are they watching like that you hit that 75 threshold? Absolutely. And as when I was in that management role, that was part of what I had to do. I took a look at it at the end of every night and I really looked at what is this person making, just leaving voicemails? Are they actually having conversations? And at that point, if I see, so if I saw someone who did had a 15 minute talk time on a conversation, I'm going to download it and listen to it. Oh, so they actually, you act, they actually have the ability to listen to the call and see what the conversation took place. Absolutely. And I use that all the time as a coaching mechanism. So if I see something, see that 20 minute call, I download it, I'll listen to it, maybe on the ride home and take some notes and you know, call that person to my office and have a conversation about it. This is what was great. Listen to how I reacted to certain verbiage. Did he just hang up on you? Did he have something funny to say? Because there have been some interesting calls that I've been sent to advisors, go after yourself or something like that. And that was when you were in the management role at the last position. So in that management role, certain things that you thought were stupid back in, you know, when you started on the internal desk, did you start to look at that and go, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make them do that. Was there anything like, like any story, any cool stories on that aspect? Or were there other things that maybe you tried to incorporate that you thought would be beneficial? that wasn't incorporated in the past. So we used to have weekly meetings when I was an internal. And towards the end, every week, a different internal would be running the meeting. That's getting an agenda, getting speakers, getting everything all buttoned up. And I wasn't a big fan of it. I thought that when you're, when you have a meeting for a team, it's for their benefit. And when I became a manager, at first I had bi-weekly meetings and ended up going to once a week. But one of the things I said I wouldn't do to these guys is 
have them be responsible for the content of the meeting. That's my role. That's part of what I do. And it's definitely challenging to find new things to talk about every week, especially at that time, the market was pretty flat. We had a 10 year somewhere around hundred basis points. So it was definitely a little monotonous. Yeah. So what we would do is we'd have, I would get either probably an external on the phone, have the internal on the phone as well. Usually towards the end, it was more of Zoom, but you know, do a role playing, find out, you know, tell them this is a Raymond James advisor who has X amount under management. And they would have to really drill down on their practice, what they're doing and starting to think on their feet. There's the level of FinTech involved with it, whether it be shuffling through offerings or seeing what other firms are doing. But at the same time, they beat them up a lot. And it was a little bit of fun. And the advisors out there, I mean, you would get, you know, my guess is you'd see a name occasionally when you were on the internal desk, as, as an example, when you were not on the management end. And you were, you know, you see this name and you're like, I got to call this guy again. How did that feel when you had to go through those situations? It depends. Really the worst call I ever had as an internal, I think it was probably like two months in, pick up the phone. Hey, this is Jared from blah, blah, blah. You're a wholesaler? Yeah. Like you have the worst job in the world. You should go kill yourself. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That hurt my feelings. Yeah. That hurt my feelings. But overall, there are certain advisors that have relationships with other distribution arms. And you know what? I'm still going to vie for that business because at the end of the day, there are things that I think I can do that they're not going to be able to do. So let's shift over to the external side because yeah. you, you did that as well. What's the biggest changes? I mean, obviously my anticipation as an advisor would be that the internal has the toughest job and the concept that they're stuck at the main office most of the time. They're probably monitored. They're probably having to keep track of hours and things along those lines. On the external side, you're somewhat free. You're going out to dinners. You're going out to lunches. You're whining and dining your people or your clients, which is financial advisors. Do I have that right? Or is there parts of being an external that are really crappy and to, on the internal side it, it, yeah you're right it is quite uh, scrutinized in that you are set to make a lot of phone calls you set to have to make appointments if your external is going out to baltimore maryland you need to have those times filled you have to have your three anchor appointment appointments breakfast lunch and dinner and then fill it between from an external side when i was doing it i was flying out on either a monday morning or a sunday night getting out to the territory usually having a you know, dinner that night and going out and starting my meetings the next day. So being away for a week is a little taxing, but you know, it's a matter of time management, managing your, you know, you don't want to be eating steak three times a day. You gotta be a little bit careful about what you're eating out there, but you, know, you, you mean on the way wise, just, oh, just overeating. It's not fun. I always heard there was a rule when it came, comes to outside of wholesalers, which is you got to pick one of two evils. You're either going to drink a little bit and eat very good, or you're not going to drink a lot and you're going to eat good. But if you do both, you'll end up being a pretty big, a uh, big, big wholesaler. It's true. That is, and I've seen quite a few of them. When we're thinking about you know, on the wholesale side, most, do you want to go out to dinner with a wholesaler that you barely know just for a free dinner? No. But it depends if they got, if they have an actual interesting product or concept or something unique, I would do it. But no, I, first of all, I'm not probably the wrong person to ask, but since you're asking, you're asking <laughs> a, a question, I probably see four wholesalers a year just because I don't do a lot of packaged products. Most of the wholesalers I see are most of the wholesalers that call are, I, I'm not seeing because again, I don't do a lot of packaged products. Right. So you know, being out on the road, it's, you really need to have your time buttoned up and going to lunch, going to drinks, going to dinners. I found that the most effective meetings were those cocktail hours because the advisor, they just want to go in, meet you a little bit, learn what you're about. Are you trustworthy? Do you have something worth really moving forward with? Then they want to go home to their families and a couple cocktails in, you get to learn a little bit more about their practice and find out what they're really about. So actually the best thing for you as an external was actually hosting like cocktail hours where there'd be advisors that would come in for a cocktail, maybe a to-go dinner or something like that. And you actually get about 10, 15 minutes with them. Yeah, I didn't, not many to-go dinners. So generally it would be a meeting with a top advisor that I'd be working with in an office. And then, you know what, it's, hey, we're doing a happy hour and wh whoever is the uh, the branch manager would round everybody up and say, hey, who wants to go? You know, got it, got it. I actually started to see wholesalers in the last few years, I get those emails that like, hey, come by while you're waiting for your food, which is actually a good idea for a wholesaler because you're getting them for a full 10 minutes while they're waiting for their food, their meal, specifically for the advisors that are always out there for the free meal. That might be the best way to get a hold of them. And the other thing that I saw a lot of wholesalers do during the pandemic was order Uber Eats to somebody's house or whatever takeout service may be. And you know what? That is getting them in front of you and having that conversation, however you can do it. 
Yeah. So the internals, obviously, the concept of being an internal wholesaler is that the external role will be available for you at some point in the future. It's kind of the carrot that's out there. I wonder what the percentage, maybe you know, but, uh, you know, is the percentage pretty high that if you're an internal wholesaler, you'll get that external gig? Or is that really only segregated out there to like the top 25? It changes based on which firm you're with. There are certain firms out there that are very heavily committed to promoting off the desk. That also depends on how, what the turnover is on the external side. So if you have, you know, have pretty good relationships, a great run rate, top of the line product, you're probably not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And it, from what I've seen in history, some of the best externals, they'll hold on to those roles for a few years. Eventually they do go for whatever reason, they, it's a change in product line or it's a change in compensation. And then those roles open up. But like where I am in South Florida, that was always a, a key role because who wouldn't want to live in South Florida if you have the opportunity to, instead of maybe Wyoming, no offense to anybody that's living in Wyoming. Oh, Jackson Hole is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, one of the things that's always gonna happen in any wholesale operation is as with more success, you have to pay out more. And at some point, you know, the firm wants to cap that. So that's something that that's generally when you'll see the turnover. Then you have somebody coming into a territory that's moderately established, who's going to be making good money. And eventually those margins compress and then they widen again. It's just like the economic cycle. Fantastic. Jared, I couldn't appreciate you coming on more, man. We learned a lot about the new role. We learned a lot about the wholesalers and what they go through on the internal desk and what they go through on the external desk. And the CRM system was somewhat interesting to me because I know as advisors, we try to make sure we understand and keep notes for our clients and you guys are keeping notes on us. It's mm -hmm. interesting to see what, what do the CRM system say about Evan Mayer or ba based on conversations that I've had with wholesalers <laughs> in the past, or did they say Evan's gatekeeper stops us from ever speaking to him? It'd be interesting, but thanks so much for your insight. It was awesome. My pleasure. If anybody does want to get a hold of you, has any questions, how can they? The so best way is through LinkedIn. So definitely hit me up on LinkedIn. It's J A R E D F I S C H E R. Awesome. And I can always get a hold of Jared if you have any questions for him. And hope you enjoyed today's podcast. And we look forward to seeing you on the next one.